Thank you uh, for your kind introduction and uh, thanks everyone uh, for having us. Um, before I let Ophaya talk about some uh, use cases and showing you some work we've done for our clients using the open source stack and open source tools, um, I would like to give you a brief introduction to NGS and also I would like to show you some trends in the figures um, I thought might be uh, quite interesting. So who are we and uh, what do we do actually? So um, NGS is a medium-sized Australian-owned business and we have offices um, across Australia almost in every state with the head office being in Perth. Um, we offer a range of different GS services from advising um, clients on spatial technology, consulting in GS services, building fit-for-purpose solutions, or provide training in the latest geospatial technology, which can be either on the commercial stack or uh, now more um, often in the open source stack. I'd like to start with a quote. Having choices in software is like having a toolbox, and you just have to pick the right tool for the job. And uh, I'm not here to advocate, advocate either on one or the other uh, I know it's an open source uh, conference and we all love open source tools, um, including myself, but sometimes there's, there's, a, there's other tools uh, you might need to use to do the job. Um, and there's obviously pro and cons um, that come into play. Um, it's, uh, that's cost and availability, um, ease of use, um, software capabilities, um, supported operation system, um, software and community support, plugins, customization and flexibility, and also comparability and data exchange. And you know, the list goes on. And uh, obviously each of these GS software tools on screen, they have their place. And uh, it's a matter of your preference and, and your experience. And also what I've learned in the last few months at uh, NGS that some clients prefer commercial software Others are more than happy to embrace open source uh, software. So like I said at the beginning, I'm, I was also trying to get some sort of sense of you know, how many users using actually open source tools. Um, and I found that great dashboard that was done by Tim Sutton, who is a QGIS developer and contributor. Um, he's an ex-QGIS project chairman and they came up with that idea back in 2017 where they thought, it would be good to get some idea what project we need to focus on next with you know, the QGIS development. So what I've done and how that works is every time when you open up QGIS on your machine, it collects some data uh, to get that dashboard up and running. Um, and they collect your full name, street address, phone number. No, I'm kidding. Um, just checking whether you're still listening. Um, so they collect the date you open QGIS, um, the QGIS version, um, the country you're in, and your operation system. Um, so once that data gets sent up to their cloud, um, um, and feel free, have a look um, yourself, it's analytics.qgis.org. Um, so I thought that was interesting to see here um, on that chart, events on Windows, which is still arguably you know, the most used operation system. And you can see that nice trend there, like going back a year, I think it's July 2022, um, it was a daily use of 50,000 users. Now we are close to 350, almost 400,000 users. And there's that nice trend um, line you see there. And if you go um, to the next slide, um, that's the monthly users also on um, um, Windows. You can clearly see, you know, we went up from 12 ma uh, million users a month now to close to actually 15 users uh, per month. And it looks like there's that trend uh, going further up. And it's almost like, a, if we go back to that other chart, it was like, I think, three to six times fold in daily usage, which is quite remarkable, to be honest. Another statistic, which is not that scientific, but hands up who's ever been on GS Stack Exchange. I would have thought almost every one of you, uh, to be honest. But what I thought that was interesting, um, interesting, a colleague of mine pointed that out to me. If you go to the tags menu, 
and you search or order your, your tags by popularity, you can see that, is a, that there is a, a lot of tags um, coming in from the open source um, tools um, like QGIS, Python, PostGIS, PyGIS, Jita, GeoServer. And then if you scroll down, that's when you start seeing, uh, you know, some of the uh, commercial um, vendors uh, popping up. And what does that mean? So for one, it could mean, you know, there's a growing interest in adoption in open source software. But it could also mean maybe there is less support in the open source uh, world. I don't know. I leave that up to you. I thought it was interesting regardless. Another interesting uh, statistics I found that was uh, recently done on LinkedIn uh, by a small company in uh, Brisbane, Australia. And um, these two questions I thought were interesting. Which types of GS do you um, use most? Um, and you can see here open source GS and uh, commercial GS was you know, they were kind of running head to head. Um, and it's not only QGIS, it's also web server and databases. But you can still see that um, the desktop GS clients uh, you prefer for your GS work is still up there, you know, with, uh, you know, 50% uh, by commercial tool and then QGIS is following. And I presume, or I guess here what happens Thinking back of the, the previous slides I showed you, you know, with that trend going slightly up, I reckon QGIS will at some point, um, you know, closing that gap over time. Another statistics uh, that's coming from NGS, and, you know, we see more requests coming in from uh, companies uh, requiring support and training uh, in open source or in QGIS in general. Um, and uh, we can see that, um, smaller local government departments looking for support and training in particular in QGIS. Um, I guess the key factor here often is the licensing cost. And also what I found interesting is mining industry um, pops up here as well. And you know, you would think those big mining companies, they have plenty of money and budget available so they can easily go with a commercial system if they wanted to. But I guess there's also these smaller exploration companies um, just starting getting into the business and they're more than happy to use um, open source or QGIS in general, which clearly can do the job um, uh, nicely. Um, so I would like to let Ophaya uh, take over and uh, she will present you some uh, use cases. Thank you. Um, so now that we've uh, had a look at some of the general trends in open source, uh, I'll go through some use cases uh, for using open source tools that we find with our clients and projects. So the first example is from Wunyama. Wunyama is uh, a sister organization of NGIS. Uh, it's an indigenous own and run business uh, that specializes in providing services and training to indigenous communities. Um, and a growing area of work uh, has been uh, providing uh, services to indigenous rangers who are interested in uh, digitizing information uh, for land management purposes. And these rangers uh, look after large tracts of land and they're interested in uh, using drone imagery uh, to be able to monitor these environmental and cultural values. Uh, but of course, processing drone images uh, can require a high level of uh, technical knowledge, and if you're using specialized uh, software as well, it can uh, be quite expensive. Uh, so to help them reduce uh, this barrier, our colleagues at Winyama set up a uh, processing pipeline for generating all the mosaics uh, and 3D photogrammetry models using the open source toolkit uh, Open Drone Map. Uh, what this means is that the ranges can uh, open up a simple web browser interface, like the one you see on the screen there, uh, log in and just upload the images that they might have taken that day. Uh, and this triggers an AWS batch job uh, to start processing these images. And these EC2 uh, instances are scalable, so uh, depending on how many images they need to process, uh, it can be uh, very cost effective. So these are some stats uh, that they received from a client uh, earlier last month. Uh, the first two 
uh, were 3D photogrammetry uh, models that they ran, uh, which only took around 20 minutes and uh, 20 cents uh, in Australian dollars. And the third one there uh, was, uh, was a mosaic job, uh, which only took around eight minutes and under a cent uh, to process a few hundred images. So leveraging our open drone map uh, reduces the financial and technical thresholds uh, for these ranges. Um, it means that they can concentrate on using the outputs for their job uh, instead of needing to upskill in, uh, in this uh, field uh, to be able to try new technology. Our second example uh, is a four-year project that we did uh, in the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific region is obviously quite exposed to the effects of sea level rise, being some of the world's lowest lying countries. And uh, the governments there were uh, interested to know what sort of climate change adaptation activities they needed to put in place uh, in order to reduce this risk. Uh, so to help them with this, we collected a lot of uh, high-resolution aerial imagery as well as LiDAR data uh, to help them get a baseline understanding of the magnitude of the problem and also identify the communities that were most at risk. Uh, but of course, it's great to collect all this uh, data. Uh, we still needed to make sure it was accessible and usable uh, to the government agencies uh, and key decision makers. Uh, PNG and Vanuatu governments uh, were keen on using open source uh, tools and so we built a comprehensive training program for them around using QGIS as well as Google Earth to process and manage this LiDAR data, uh, perform coastal inundation modelling and risk assessments. And the results from this training program was that they were able to create a coastal risk assessment report uh, specific to their country um, and this helped initiate conversations around climate adaptation policy, infrastructure planning, and disaster management. Uh, more recently, we've had a couple of projects in the resources and energy sectors. Uh, the first with Rum Resources, which is a small mining company um, who were interested in looking at a low-cost option uh, to visualize and manage the field data. Uh, this was quite a straightforward use case because they didn't have any pre-existing GIS systems in place. And so we were able to help, this, uh, help them set this up from scratch and provide training uh, to use QGIS locally. And this was uh, more than sufficient for them in the startup phase because they didn't have any complicated geoprocessing workflows or large data sets to manage. Uh, PowerLink, on the other hand, is a large power supply company in Queensland. They have a complex uh, enterprise system already in place uh, based on proprietary software, but they were interested in uh, looking at an open source option to help them cut down on costs. Uh, and their use case is uh, quite specific, so they have a lot of assets on the ground, and when an incident happens like a bushfire, it triggers a uh, a series of processing workflows and queries to see which of the assets might be at risk uh, and whether or not they need to send personnel out there. Um, this was quite a slow and expensive process uh, based on Oracle and SME workbenches, and we're now trying to replicate these uh, in post-GIS. Um, and even though, uh, though it uh, involved process in setting up and replicating all of these queries and workflows, uh, in the long run, it should help them cut down on costs uh, significantly. So some of our work uh, in the open source arena so far has been uh, around providing training um, and building GIS capabilities for our clients, uh, helping them set up processing pipelines and integrating uh, new tools uh, within their existing system. The main driver that we've seen uh, for our clients uh, for using open source has been uh, cost and accessibility. Uh, it lowers the barrier for entry, especially for organizations with limited funding or are just starting out on their GIS journey. Um, and they only require basic systems and workflows and it doesn't make sense for them to pay for expensive licenses for complicated tools that they probably don't need or use. And of course, open source is 
a lot more appealing to these companies uh, because they don't have any uh, pre-existing uh, GIS systems to worry about. So in summary, uh, what we've learned so far is that there seems to be a growing interest in using open source tools more generally. Whether or not uh, open source tools are appropriate depends on uh, understanding our clients' requirements. So we really need to uh, get a better understanding of what tools work best for them, uh, for their budget, and what features they need. Um, the majority of our clients are still large organizations, uh, usually with uh, enterprise systems based on proprietary software. Uh, but there seems to be a, a growing interest in trying to incorporate uh, open source tools, such as with um, our PowerLink client. Um, and so a hybrid solution might be a good alternative. I think the most important thing for us uh, to keep in mind when implementing open source solutions is to demonstrate to our clients that we understand their requirements, um, show that we can help them integrate with any existing GIS systems, and uh, show that open source tools can be just as reliable and secure as their proprietary counterparts. So thank you. But you mentioned how a lot of these places use it as a starting tool. Is there, do you find that people migrate into the commercial offerings rather than the, than the open source over time, or do they stick with the uh, open source? Um, I haven't seen that uh, so far. I was involved in that um, project for RAM Resources, and um, they're quite happily you keep going with, uh, with Puget's. Um, um, I, I wouldn't know of any other project where other companies decided to go, you know, with the other more commercial vendors um, so far. I think maybe it depends on maybe how fast they're growing as well and if they need additional support, maybe uh, proprietary software might be more appealing to them. So maybe it depends case by case. Um, so it's interesting to hear that you're seeing big customers coming to you and they've got a growing appetite um, to use open source. Is that, do you think you're more confident that it's more reliable these days or is it really, really price sensitive or um, is it a mix? I'm just wondering what drivers are you seeing for your customers? I found uh, when I talk to clients, um, often the key factor is, is literally the licensing cost. Uh, so that's yeah. the that's the biggest driver. It's not so much security or you know what the tool can actually achieve because most of these open source tools can pretty much achieve achieve everything the commercial vendors can do. Um, so yeah, often it's 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 the cost and the budget they have available. And I guess with um, PowerLink as well, there was a opportunity for them to review how they're using their software because they're already doing a, a big data migration, and so they saw that as an opportunity to maybe incorporate open source. Okay. Well, I love security, so I'm quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, okay. Oh, now what we've got another question here. Oh, sorry. Oh, just me. Did you have a question? Yes. Oh, come and do your question first, and then we'll... Also okay, I'll go first. Um, okay, uh, I, I've seen the differences between the proprietary and the open source, and I think one common thing as well that these uh, tools have is an underlying support community. So I'm sure you've, I haven't been to an SV conference, so um, uh, how do you think can the open source community support uh, the open source tools? And maybe, yeah, I, I, and the same thing, I'd like to also add, how is it in an SV conference? <laughs> yeah. 
That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I've been a couple of times to uh, an NSA user conference, and um, I found in the past, you know, if, if we had tr trouble getting, you know, um, some services or, or projects going and we couldn't find any support within Australia, um, the, uh, the guys at the conference at ESRI uh, were quite helpful. Uh, when it comes to open source, I found, actually online you find a lot of help, um, not only, you know, through some of these pages I showed today with uh, GS Stack Exchange, but there's also a lot of videos available on YouTube, which I find really useful. Um, or I just Google and, you know, end up finding something um, interesting and useful um, for whatever I need to get done. Um, so that's how I do it. Um, I don't know whether you want to add anything. Um, yeah, I guess to, uh, for large organizations, I guess maybe proprietary software is appealing because there is that uh, ongoing support and you know who to go to. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a hard question to answer in terms of um, support within the open source community. Um, I guess, um, yeah, large organizations might not want to go down that path because they don't really know who to go to. And if there was a, a centralized place uh, that the community can uh, uh, build, um, to help support that, um, maybe it would uh, make it more appealing for more organizations to migrate over. Hi, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, I thought it was really interesting seeing the um, quantifying the, the rise in enthusiasm users over time. I think that's really interesting to see that. Um, I think something that I probably observe in my industry, archaeology and heritage, uh, is that uh, we're starting to like a, a bit of a tipping point where um, we're getting increasing institutional acceptance of open source alternatives, and that is leading then to more institutions seeing, okay, well these guys are doing it, you know, therefore we can adopt it as well and, and, and get those benefits. Um, so I, I, I would guess, I mean, certainly I know that's anecdotal, but, but, but you know, I can only speak for myself and colleagues of mine. Um, um, and so I, I, I would hope that that uh, leads to a, a, a bit of a rise, and that, that might be what we're seeing if it's quite a dramatic increase over the last couple of years. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Got one question down the front. Uh, not so much a question, but just to sort of add to that sort of support in open source space. Uh, the group Lootdraft over in um, Europe, um, they offer like a subscribe maintenance support for your, uh, for your open source stack. And they've uh, talked about selling that to organizations for X amount of dollars and it's never used. Their IT department just wanted to know that there was someone they could call. Um, so there's that space or way to sort of go as well to make companies feel uh, that open source is there for them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so we will run it.